gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Denis Chagnon, and I will be your master of ceremonies for the next three days. It's actually a privilege for me to welcome you to the 13th Symposium and Exhibition on the ICAO Traveler Identification Program. Our focus this year will be on making air travel more secure and efficient. We will do this through better traveler identification management for enhanced border control integrity. On your behalf, let me express our most sincere appreciation to the many special guests, speakers, and moderators who have kindly taken time out of their busy schedules to be with us today, to share their experience, their insight, and their vision concerning the future of air travel. Let me also thank the many sponsors and exhibitors whose products and services complement the issues and challenges that will be discussed throughout the symposium. Before we get underway, I do have a few housekeeping items. First, I would kindly ask that you turn off or place on silent mode your cell phones and other electronic equipment so that we do not distract from the presentations. I would also ask that you return promptly to the assembly hall following coffee breaks and lunch breaks, and of course, in the morning coming in. And finally, we do have simultaneous interpretation for all official sessions of the symposium. As always, simply make your selection among the six working languages of ICAO. And now it gives me great pleasure to invite to the lectern Dr. Fang Liu, Secretary General of ICAO, to officially open the symposium. Dr. Liu. Thank you, Denis. Excellencies, distinguished representatives to the ICAO Council, Distinguished guests and delegates, ladies, gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Akio Traveler Identification Program TRIP Symposium. Our theme this year is making air travel more secure and efficient, and I'm sure we are all motivated to achieve this result. Support of the TRIP strategy is essential to ICAO's security and facilitation strategic objective. The main part of our work in this area is conducted under the standards and the recommended practices SOPs of Annex 9 to the Chicago Convention on facilitation and through the specifications in ICAO Doc 9309 that support machine-readable travel documents. The ICAO TRIP strategy helps to harmonize the global line of defense in our shared battles, confronting international terrorist movements, cross-border crime, and many other threats to the safety and security of a civil society and international aviation. The importance given to ICAO's TRIP strategy by the international community has been in ample evidence this year. I observed this when I briefed the UN Security Council in September and attended its counter-terrorism committee in July. The contributions of the TRIP strategy are well recognized by United Nations Security Council as reflected in Security Council resolutions 2178, 2309, and 2368, which were adopted in 2014, 2016, and 2017, respectively. The special meeting of the Counter Terrorist Committee proposed that the UN Counter Terrorist Executive Directorate in cooperation with ICAO, should continue 
to explore new means of addressing terrorist threats through various trip elements. As a preliminary outcome, relevant gaps and vulnerabilities have been identified. Existing policies, instruments, and tools supporting effective border control management systems have also been addressed. The enhancement of aviation security and facilitation are twin and reciprocal objectives. Facilitation focuses on enhancing the efficiency and effectiveness of passenger processing with the added benefit of enhancing passengers' air travel experience. These efforts have largely been guided by consecutive amendments to Annex 9 facilitation of the Chicago Convention. Indeed, along with enhanced screening and security checks, the United Nations Counter-Terrorist Committee also highlighted the important role of global airlines in tracking the movement of higher risk passengers. Specifically, it recognized the importance of national authorities sharing advanced passenger information, API, to help mitigate associated risks. <coughs> Much more progress remains to be achieved with respect to the implementation of API systems. Many states have not yet introduced related programs. As of 23 October of this year, however, I would like to remind all states that API sharing is mandatory under Annex 9 of Chicago Convention. Following this obligation, ACU expects that a much greater degree of API sharing will take place. This is supported by the nearly complete global transition to machine-readable passports. As of today, 146 of ACU's 191 member states are fully compliant with this standard. It is critical for governments to encourage the replacement of any non-compliant passports still in circulation. Mm. Moreover, more than 110 acute member states are now issuing e-passports. There are already some 639 million currently circulating, while e-passports are a key contributor to effective border integrity I would like to stress, however, that the issuance of e-passports is only a recommended practice and not mandated by an ACL standard. Another key implementation issue pertains to membership and use of the ACL public key directory, PKD, which is fundamental. I would like to note that ACL set out a new PKD operating agreement last year, fees have been reduced. For new participants, the reduction is substantial. However, although more than 80% of e-passports in global circulation are issued by states already participating in the PKD, many states possessing domestic or foreign e-passports are still not utilizing the PKD to authenticate the chip-based data. It is vital that they do. Another key aspect is state's obligation to prevent the reuse of stolen, lost, or revoked travel documents. A state letter of 24 July of this year urges member states to implement standard 3.10 of Annex 9. This standard requires the prompt and accurate reporting of these documents to Interpol for inclusion in the stolen and lost travel documents SLTD database. 
it also encourages states to adopt recommended practice 3.10.1 of Annex 9 of the Chicago Convention, encouraging the inquiry of travel documents against this Interpol database at all border control points. States' implementation of the TRIP strategy, including the specific and crucial points I've just mentioned, requires coordinated action between many government and industry entities. This can include passport issuing offices, aviation security authorities, civil registries, border control and law enforcement and agencies, airlines, airport authorities, the travel document industry, and immigration authorities. The mechanism and the requirement for this coordination already exist in Annex 9 of the Chicago Convention through national air transport facilitation programs and their related committees. However, many states have yet to establish a comprehensive national facilitation program, a national air transport facilitation committee, or airport facilitation committees. Progress here would greatly support the TRIP strategy. Meanwhile, ACO is establishing a more systematic approach to assisting states on these and other TRIP elements. This enhancement includes the ACL trip implementation roadmap for member states, which provides implementation guidance at the national level. This is consistent with the objectives of ACL's No Country Left Behind initiative, which focus on the efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability of our provision of assistance and the capacity building for member states. Through this assistance, we aim to help states optimize their aviation connectivity and in turn augment the many social economic benefits that result from ACL compliance. We are aware that member states' capacities in terms of implementation of ACL trip strategy vary. Majors have been taken by Q and the states to address this gap by fostering cooperation, promoting government industry collaboration, intensifying coordination of partners at the regional and the local levels, and mobilizing donor contributions. Accordingly, with the support from various donors, such as the Government of Canada, facilitation assistance projects have been successfully concluded. A project implemented in the Sahel region resulted in the development of a new ACL training package. It is designed for all member states' forefront immigration and border control inspection officers. It has been already delivered to officers in African states and delivery is planned for other regions such as Latin America. Another new project, also funded by Canada, is being developed to strengthen border control management in the Caribbean region. As part of its outcomes, we expect to produce a new set of guidelines focused on effective border control management. This will certainly complement the inaugural edition of the new planning and implementation guide, the ACL Trip Strategy Compendium, which ACL has just completed. It showcases the joint efforts and actions by several international organizations and includes references to relevant guidance material. This type of collaboration is making crucial contributions, not only to the implementation of ACL's provisions, but also the global response to the United Nations Security Council resolutions I referred to earlier. We enjoy excellent working relationships 
with many key international organizations in this field, including the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNOCT, Interpol, the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and International Organization for Migration, IOM, to name just a few. And we are also encouraging states to cooperate at the regional and sub-regional levels. Before concluding, allow me to give an example of a training project resulting from our cooperation with the International Office for Migration. Since it was launched last July, frontline in inspection officers from Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda have benefited from new courses and best practice guidance. In short, agreement and collaboration among all stakeholders on travel facilitation program action plans, including all elements of the trip strategy, is very much encouraged. Another example here is the significant and a detailed work that is also being carried out behind the scenes on the development of new specifications and guidance materials by hard-working experts from member states and related industry organizations. These materials will support the significant work that remains ahead for states and ICAO as we strive to further coordinate our efforts and rectify aviation security and facilitation deficiencies in a robust and affordable manner. As I mentioned earlier, only by ensuring both reciprocal, reciprocal aspects will our proposed solutions be truly sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it has been my great pleasure today to bring you up to date on the varied initiatives presently underway to assist with the effective implementation of the ACL TRIP strategy. I'm confident that by working together and fostering greater coordination among the many agencies and stakeholders involved in this work, we can enhance still further the security and convenience of borders and air transport. As a preeminent global event on travel documents and related facilitation concerns for states, this 13th TRIP Symposium will provide all of us a unique opportunity in this regard. The networking opportunities here, for example, are unparalleled. Lastly, I would like briefly like to remind our Caribbean and Central American colleagues about upcoming Akil Trip Regional Sem Seminar in Montego Bay, Jamaica. This event will be hosted by the Civil Aviation Authority of Jamaica from 28 to 30 November this year. Like this event, it will provide you with an important opportunity to enhance international and regional cooperation in aid of your facilitation and ACL trip challenges. Thank you all once again for joining us here in Montreal. May I wish you all an enjoyable and very productive 13th trip symposium. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for your guidance and your inspiring words as we undertake our symposium. Our keynote speakers this morning will offer a regional perspective on the global challenges we face collectively. We begin with Mr. Dennis Cosgrove, Head of Border Security and Management, Transnational Threats Department, at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Mr. Cosgrove. What should I do? I my water. Okay. okay. 
Well, Raqqa has fallen. The so-called Islamic State has lost control of its de facto capital. Its territory has shriveled or is shriveling. Its leaders are on the run. Is this the end of Daesh or Islamic State or ISIS? Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis Cosgrove. I'm with the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I represent today the Transnational Threats Department from the Secretariat in Vienna. Unfortunately, in, in answering my own question about the state of the Islamic State, I would say the answer is no. ISIS leaders signaled more than a year ago that they had contingency plans to revert to their roots as a guerrilla force. They don't need territory to inspire attacks elsewhere. Without the need to retain territory, its fighters can turn their attention to committing acts elsewhere. Foreign terrorist fighters, unfortunately, will likely now seek to return home. Sleeper cells that are in existence can be awoken. So the threat of attacks outside of Syria and Iraq remains and has perhaps even increased. Today, using two case studies, I will highlight the terrorist threat of both known and unknowns, and I'll outline some ways that we can counter this formidable threat. So I'd like to begin with the first case study. I'd like to tell you a brief story about a young French man of Algerian heritage called Mehdi Lamouche. Mehdi grew up in north of France near Lille. It was a poor neighborhood and Mehdi was involved in crime from a very young age. He was sent to a French prison 10 years ago in 2007 for armed robbery. During, during this time in prison, Mehdi started spending time with violent extremists and he began the process of being radicalized, radicalization. His prison associates became known to French counterterrorism officials and they placed him on a national watch list. So Mehdi was released from prison in 2012 and made immediate plans to travel to Syria to fl fight with Daesh, with Islamic State. So instead of traveling by air, Mehdi took the well-worn path across Europe, into Turkey, and across the Syrian border in January 2017. So once there, he joined up with the Islamic State and there are reports of him beating, torturing, and killing Western hostages. Once counterterrorism officials learned that he was now fighting in Syria, they raised his alert level. They also had him placed on a European and international watch list. So you would think that after spending a year in Syria, being on a national, European, international watch list, Mehdi would find it difficult to travel. Well, in March 2014, Mehdi decided he wanted to return to Europe. But instead of traveling directly to his destination, he used so-called broken travel, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with this term by now. He traveled by land into Turkey, then took a flight from Turkey to Malaysia. And once there in Malaysia, he spent time in Asia, traveled to Singapore. From there, from Singapore, he took a flight to Frankfurt, Germany. Now, although Germany has an advanced passenger international information system, the Singapore to Frankfurt flight was not classified as a high priority flight. Therefore, Medi's API data was not checked against any watch list in advance. It was only after he had left Frankfurt airport 
So he lands in Frankfurt, he leaves the airport, that authorities became aware that Mehdi was back in Europe. So a known terrorist suspect on multiple watch lists and databases was able to travel by air unimpeded. So from Frankfurt, he traveled by land to Brussels. Okay. Two months later, on May 24th, 2014, Mehdi went to the Jewish Museum in Brussels with a Kalashnikov, Kalashnikov rifle. In less than one minute, he had killed four people. We can point to multiple security gaps here. However, if states had been systematically collecting advanced passenger information from airlines and automatically cross-checking this data against relevant national, regional, and international watch lists, it's highly unlikely that Mehdi Namouche would have been able to fly back into Europe to commit this heinous t terrorist act. That's the benefit of an API system. It allows passenger data to be sent to border officials in advance so the passenger can be cross-checked before they arrive at our borders. So what are we doing to support states? Thankfully, it's now recognize that we need to significantly increase the use of API across the globe. The OSCE, my organization, a regional security organization, is a partner in a UN-led initiative to implement Security Council Resolution 2178. This partnership includes ICAO, IOM, Interpol, IATA, and others. We have been collaborating to raise awareness of states' requirements on API and to support their implementation. In addition, the 57 OSCE participating states adopted a political, politically binding ministerial decision on enhancing the use of API. Thirdly, the OSC works directly with states in order to draft detailed national roadmaps for implementing an API system. This covers the legal, technical, administrative, and organizational aspects. Can we do more? Of course. As international organizations, instead of telling states what they have to do, we can increase our efforts to show them how to do it and give them the resources to do so. We could give free and open access to the ICAO annexes related to passenger data. We could give more legislative advice, technical support, and of course, most importantly, funding for establishing these systems. So in the words of a politician seeking re-election, re -election, I would say a lot done, but more to do. I would like to now turn to the second case study regarding unknowns. Okay. Okay, the second case study I would like to highlight is related to a migrant boat that traveled to the Greek island of Leros in October 2015. Of course, there were, as we all know, there were thousands of desperate migrants arriving at this time, and Greek authorities were understandably overwhelmed. Four of the men on this particular boat were not who they said they were. They claimed to be Syrian refugees. However, in reality, they were being sent by Daesh, Islamic State, to infiltrate the migrant route in order to carry out a terrorist attack in Europe. None of these men were known to authorities in advance. They were also assuming false identities. All four were carrying fake Syrian passports. These were blank stolen passports taken by ISIS 
with new bio data pages inserted. Very difficult to detect. We know now that of these four men, two were from Iraq, one from Algeria, and one from Pakistan. Unfortunately, Frontex was assisting Greek authorities at the time that this boat arrived. The Algerian and Pakistani men raised suspicions. The Algerian knew nothing about his supposed hometown of Aleppo. The Pakistani did not speak Arabic. They were handed over to Greek police. The two Iraqis, however, were not detected. Their false identities were more convincing. So they continued their planned journey through the Western Balkan migration route. They crossed multiple borders and managed to enter the European Union. From there, they traveled quickly to their final destination, which was Paris. On 13 November, the Iraqis were two of the nine men that went on a rampage around Paris, killing 130 people. Their Syrian passports were found at the scene. In fact, over 11,000 of these passports were stolen by Islamic State. Improving our border security to counter such unknown terrorist threats is very difficult. However, there are concrete things that we can do. The OSCE, for its part, has established a foreign terrorist fighter mobile training team. This team is traveling the OSCE area to train states on profiling, interviewing, and on behavioral and targeting techniques. In fact, just this year we have conducted trainings in Sarajevo and in Tashkent, and we really intend to ramp up and expand our efforts next year. And myself and, and, and Simon are here to actually to talk to you at length about the team if, if any of you have interest, because we think it's a wonderful initiative and we can give you more background on it. Well, the OSC also has a long-running program in training in the detection of forged documents and imposters. We train frontline officers, second-line officers, and do train-the-trainer courses, which is very, very important. It involves hands-on training with real and fake documents. We've also donated inspection equipment to the trainees. This might not seem so significant, but believe me, when they have no equipment, and this equipment is so relevant, it, it's very much valued and very, very important. We've, an orga we've organized 11 of these trainings just this year. Once again, I ask, can we do more? Frankly, our border guards need more resources, more training, and more personnel to carry out their jobs, which are increasingly, increasingly complex, demanding and stressful, by the way. This type of training is constantly in demand. Although there are many organizations and countries carrying out trainings, there is little to no coordination or information sharing. This, this leads, and it can lead, to duplication, waste of resources that can be used elsewhere, obviously. So I think coordination and information sharing is still vitally important in this ever interconnected global community that we all live in now. ICAO could play a role here through its capacity building working group. So, conclusion. In conclusion, I highlighted two case studies that show that the terrorist risk, that show terrorist risk of both knowns and unknowns. I spoke about what my organization, the OSCE, and the international community is doing to counter these threats. And I must say, if I didn't already allude to this, all of our trainings and our workshops that we do in capacity development are done in very close partnership with our 
our other organizations and agencies that we work with. So we're, we're not going this, we're not going on this alone, obviously. Um, I see posters around this amazing building. It's my first time here, by the way, and, and it is quite impressive. That show ICAO's objective, leave no country behind. We fully support this goal, and I love I love this objective, and I, I think it really captures pretty much everything about all of us in this one global, ever-shrinking world. However, in the OSCE area, because we're a regional security cooperation organization, there are still countries being left behind. We can do more to support them in establishing passenger data exchange systems and to ensure that their border guards have the skills and capacity that they need to carry out such important work. Raqqa may have fallen, and IS may be in some sort of a retreat. However, the threat to our border security remains. That's the reason that the OSCE is here at ICAO TRIP Symposium today. Finally, I would like to thank the organize, organizers for inviting me. Myself and my colleagues, Simon Degnan and Zoran Djokovic, are here throughout the event to improve our collaboration with you. Thank you all once again, and, and I wish you a very successful symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cosgrove, for this reality check and the reminder that the ch challenge is indeed a long-term one. Our next speaker is Monsieur Pierre Lapac, Regional Representative for West and Central Africa for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Monsieur Lapac. Mr. Lapac. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So the two cases uh, presented by Dennis showing us uh, the threat and the, the involved risks, I will be presenting a UNODC project called AirCOP. And my presentation hopefully will be a little bit more relevant because it will show you how by working together at the national at the regional and the international level, it is possible to be more efficient in addressing those threats, at least in airports. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Mr. Yuri Fedotov, the Executive Director of the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, I would like to thank the International Civil Aviation Organization for inviting UNODC to the 13th Symposium on the ICAO Travel Identification Program. Through its extensive network of field offices, UNODC supports member states in confronting a host of menace, including terrorism, trafficking of illicit drugs, human beings, weapons, natural resources, counterfeit goods, including medicines, as well as cybercrime. In some region, in particular the Sahel, a region covered by the Office for West and Central Africa, I am heading. The nexus between terrorism and drug trafficking is also a growing concern. UNODC also supports strategies to prevent and fight corruption and enable to all other types of crime. As drugs, illicit goods, and high passengers may transit several times before reaching their final destination, law enforcement agencies may receive key information in this process. The culture of intelligence gathering and information sharing between the different law enforcement agencies in one country, as well as between sources, transit, and destination countries is therefore essential. While collecting information, cooperation with airlines is also key. The pre-arrival Profiling and targeting, I will be using these words intelligently today, of passengers and goods is part of the broad global security continuum that consists 
of systems and processes that should slow down, detect, intercept, and examine suspicious passengers and cargo. An efficient pre-arrival profiling results in targeted controls rather than random or systematic controls, which is usually led to congestion and bottlenecks in the general movement of passengers and goods. The idea, if you wish, is to reduce the size of the haystack in order to find more easily the needle. However, such profiling is highly dependent on the validity of information provided to law enforcement agencies by carriers, shippers, freight forwarders, and importers. In this regard, th three Security Council resolutions call all member states to require that airlines operating in these territories provide advanced passengers information, IPI, to the appropriate national authorities. Upon receipt, by a relevant law enforcement agency, the API data is then checked against national and international watch lists, United Nations sanction list, and relevant Interpol database to allow for the identification of suspicious and high-risk passengers, including foreign terrorist fighters. Profiling and targeting are also undertaken by analyzing travel data against risk indicators related to a country of origin of the goods or passengers, the nature of the declared goods and the identification of broken travel routes, for example. Such analysis is undertaken manually, as well as increasingly using risk analysis software able to digest the data collected and to flag potential risks. In addition, real-time targeting, random examination, blitzes, and border control remain an important complement for pre-arrival targeting. To support countries in these different stages, UNODC implements an airport communication project called airport, AirCOP since 2010 in partnership with Interpol and the World Customs Organization. AirCOP aims to root the culture of intelligence gathering and information sharing in the working routine of law enforcement agencies located in airports and to develop their capacity to undertake risk analysis and profiling, targeting based on intelligence and information of all type of threats. It does so by first supporting the establishment of what we call Interagency Joint Airport Interdiction Task Force, called JATF, which brings together different law enforcement agencies operating at airport. For example, police, customs, immigration, airport authority, national security, drug enforcement, etc. Then, facilitating real-time transmission of information at national, regional, and international levels through connections made by Interpol, I-24-7 database, and the CENCOM system of WCO. Thirdly, providing the task forces which tra with training and mentoring on behavioral analysis, search techniques, control of fraudulent and counterfeit documents, or profiling and risk analysis, for example. AirCOP currently covers Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. Currently, 20 task forces are operational. Two have been established five are under establishment and should be operational in 2018. In the past five years, the different task force recovered over, uh, recorded sorry, over 1,300 arrests and seizures, both in passengers and cargo area. The seizures amount to over three tons of different drugs, but also two tons of counterfeit medicines, ivory, undeclared cash, and fake passport and ammunition. They also intercepted various potential foreign terrorist fighters in the Sahel, but also surprisingly in the Caribbean. In spite 
of the already mentioned UN Security Council resolutions, many countries do not have yet the required legislation for law enforcement to access API and PNR and have not been established mod modalities between law enforcement agencies and airlines. Such legislation are important to ensure that legal and commercial concerns of airlines are considered in the use of the API PNR data by law enforcement agencies. AirCorp currently supports the JETF on an ad hoc basis on, in discussing with airlines for the receipt of inbound and outbound passengers manifest, the consultation of PNR data, as well as direct access to such data. Going further, extensive work is required with uh, the support of the civil aviation authorities for the development of national legislations on the provision by airlines of API data to national authorities, as well as PNR data to the extent possible. Advocacy work is also required toward airlines to explain the advantages of pre-arrival targeting and the importance of sharing the relevant data. In this context, UNODC is looking forward to working with the International Civil Aviation Organization to support the implementation of practices and procedures to safeguard international civil aviation against all types of threats and to promote a culture of collective responsibility and collaborative response to airport security. This symposium will give us a great opportunity to discuss ways to enhance regional and international cooperation and collaboration to address the threats faced by international civil aviation. I thank you for your attention, and I wish you a successful symposium. Many thanks. Thank you, Monsieur Lapac, for again a very relevant presentation to our symposium this morning. Completing our overview is Mr. Francis de Chrivere. He is local security officer at the Directorate General for Human Resources and Security of the European Commission. Monsieur de Chrivere. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored and pleased to be invited by ICAO at this symposium because it gives me a unique opportunity to present the new form of the laissez-passer of the European Union. In the next couple of minutes, I would like to share with you the reflections that have triggered a huge transformation in the way travel documents are handled by EU institutions, and in particular for their staff traveling for the service or being posted in a foreign country. After 9-11 and the attacks in New York City and Washington DC with hijacked aircraft, it was obvious for everyone that a reliable link between a passenger and a travel document that this passenger presented at boarding time was compulsory. For sure, this was not the case with the old form of the EU laissez-passer. A travel document must be secure in its issuance process to prevent fraudulent use, and it must doubtlessly tied the genuine order with some of its characteristics. Hence the incorporation of biometric data in electronic machine readable travel documents. More recently, many of the EU member states faced terrorist attacks on their territory, perpetrated by people entering the Union illegally. We didn't consult with uh, Dennis, but that's the fact. And our border control officers struggle with abnormal flows of refugees whose confident identification is often impossible. My job as a security officer includes risk management. And whoever has done this before knows that you have to evaluate the likelihood and the impact of an undesired event and take measures to avoid this risk to happen or diminish it to an acceptable level. 
In our case of issuing travel documents for EU staff, we committed to comply with ICAO specification and with EU standards applicable to national electronic passport issued by the EU member states. This commitment provides a response to all risk in relation with forgery, falsification, or alteration of travel documents. By the end of 2013, the Council of the European Union adopted a new regulation, Council Regulation 1417, laying down the new form of the EU, of the laissez-passer of the European Union, ULP in short. Now, the new form of the laissez-passer issued by the European Union is a very secure document that would require a huge effort should someone try to produce a fake one, seeing the number of security features it includes. We also committed to issue the new EULP before November 25 of 2015 to respect the deadline for abandoning documents in circulation with no machine-readable zone. For those who remember the old form of the EULP and have seen the current one, they can easily imagine that the EU institution had to close a technical gap of more than 40 years. Changing from a simple booklet with handwritten data and a punch photograph to a full compliant electronic passport with biometric uh, capture of fingerprints and a facial image was a revolution for our staff and members. The risk is no more in the authenticity of the document but in the issuance procedures. For enrollment as an international organization, we don't run or manage a register of identities, but we rely on the national ID cards and passport as breeder documents to ascertain the identity of the applicant. The personalization process is depending on three parties for issuing an ULP. We have the external contractor, we have the central service of the European Commission, and we have the joint research center in Italy as certification authority, which makes corruptions more difficult. So, what did the European Union reach with this new form of the laissez-passer? Allow me first to remind briefly the legal basis of the laissez-passer of the European Union. The LP is defined in Article 6 of the Protocol on the Privileges and Immunities of the European Union. This is one of the annexes to the European treaties. It's a travel document that must be recognized by EU member states and that can be recognized by other countries, and this according to bilateral agreements. It can only be used within the context of serving the Union. And for staff and their family on long stay outside the Union, this is typically the case for uh, families and uh, officials posted in an EU delegation for a couple of years, the LP is the document to be used for proper notification and residency in the hosting country. In November 2015, the first produced EU LPs were used by our EU officials and the European Commission, together with the European External Action Services, launched its communication campaign to have the new travel document known around the world. For staff and their family in delegations, you have to uh, know that uh, the European Union has around 140 diplomatic missions in third countries. This new form of the EULP is an unquestionable document stating their diplomatic status and is treated like a diplomatic passport by many of countries. Since the introduction, in certain countries where it was not mandatory for the notification of diplomatic agent, it has become obligatory. Being ICAO compliant, and fully interoperable with inspection systems at border control has increased the number of countries recognizing it as a travel document, which is, of course, facilitating our EU staff's lives on missions. And moreover, this compliance with the standards of EU national passport has opened a straightforward process to include the document in free visa waiver programs. A clear achievement is shown by the agreement signed with the People's Republic of China. More and more countries accept to issue free visas in the new laissez-passer, as it is easily traceable, thus traveling has become easier and safer. This has also 
a positive impact on safety of our people when they are sent to sensitive region, regions, being it for humanitarian aid, cooperation or development reasons. As safeguarding the security of our staff is one of our top priorities, unavoidably, we must prepare ourselves for immediate evacuations. The fact that the ULP is becoming a global player and that it offers the possibility for free visa or facilitated visa procedures, evacuation routes are more accessible, easier to plan, as there, no, there is no unnecessary and complicated administrative hindrance. With this regulation 1417 of end 2013, the European Union expressed its willingness to have the document validated worldwide. And it is in that context that it will participate in ICAO's public key directory as of next year. At EU level, we will start the implementation of a single point of contact project in order to allow the EU member states authorities to get an extended access to the fingerprints data on the chip of the EULP and consequently allow a one-to-one -one matching verification of the identity of the passenger, enhancing the security of travelers and contributing to fraud detection. And like national administration, the EU participates in the interoperability and compliance test for electronic passports. We also know that a document providing some advantages is a candidate for surgery. So far, no notification of fake LPs has been reported, but that doesn't mean that this will never happen, especially if it's treated like a diplomatic passport. The contract that the European Commission signed on behalf of the European Union in 2015 for the production and personalization of EU laissez passes foresees a new design of the document at midterm, so around 2020. Again, this is typically a measure to mitigate the risk of counterfeiting the EULP by shortening the lifetime of one travel document version. This journey of the new form of the European laissez passer is not finished, ladies and gentlemen. We still need to increase the level of recognition of this document, especially by airline companies, to facilitate the travel of our staff on mission abroad the Union. I will conclude by repeating that it was a phenomenal transformation for the EU institution and agencies to cope with the new form of the laissez-passer, but all those efforts are rewarded by safer and easier traveling for our staff. Issuing a secure document trusted by, other, by others is vital for safe traveling, and the European Union is committed to do so. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. de Chribery, and again, Mr. Cosgrove and Mr. Lapac, for having shared your viewpoints on some of the timely and important topics we will be discussing over the next three days. Before we break for coffee, let me invite to the lectern Mr. Boubacar Djipo, Director of the Air Transport Bureau of ICAO, for his welcoming remarks. Monsieur Djibo. Merci, Monsieur Chagnon. Thank you, sir. Uh, very quickly, because all have been said, um, just to, to thank you for being here and to explain to you why it's important to have you. Okay. We have been instructed in the Secretariat to ensure that each and every member state of ICAO have the possibility to implement our regulatory framework. I think it's important to recall it, and this is why we have this kind of event, and you thought that uh, the Secretary General herself took time to come and address that audience. Second thing, we need to benefit from the contribution of the industry and the private sector. ICAO state cannot implement what is needed without the contribution of the industry, because, for example, we need to have the technology to put in place the system to have the information what is needed. So, thirdly, we need to put in place a kind of a forum where we can discuss friendly without the formal 
contribution or intervention linked to the position that member states need to take. For that purpose, already we have an agreement. Member states have agreed to move from MRTD to a TRIP concept. And for us, it has been uh, recalled by the intervention, that concept covers everything. Machine-readable travel document, possibly e-passport, which is not yet a standard. We have the membership of the PKD. We have the information linked to API, and we have the information linked to PNR. And additionally, we have the information in the visas for the state or the individual which need visa. So it's a whole package, and it has been said and recalled all of the state should be able to understand that we need to move together and should be aware of the technology, of the possibility to implement the system. <laughs> of course, our partners from the global uh, organization, IATA, ACI, need to be on board because it happens in the airport and it's happened through the information which has to be provided by the airline. So we want to ensure that we have the common understanding. Then, uh, of course, you have noted through the intervention that in addition to the state, the regional approach is essential mandatory. We cannot move without the region, the organization coming to us. And we are not alone, and we are proud to see our colleague to be with here. We cannot implement that trip concept alone. And this is why we have all our partners. So it's important to recall that we need to work together. What can we do? Uh, it has been recalled, and we anticipate that each of you have received a copy of the compendium. We have been instructed, and it has been validated, to produce something that everybody can understand. In addition to the formal regulation, the state letter, whatever we put, we need to have something that everybody understand. Why we need together to work together, it's here. You see that all our partners are in. Then we have moved officially now to TRIP. And we wish to thank all those who have supported that uh, uh, framework because it's difficult for ICAO to have the resources. And we thank all those who have member state, industry, colleagues who came in to support that trip. Uh, we have received some secondees from China, from Korea, from Japan, from France. Uh, but specifically, we need to thank Canada. Canada have supported the Secretariat in putting several projects of assistance. And we are thanking Canada not only on behalf of the Secretariat, but all the member states which received the assistance. It's important to recall that we cannot uh, continue and implement no country left behind if we cannot continue to benefit from the assistance. And of course, we, uh, we wish to thank you and we anticipate that after that we'll be able to report to the Secretariat to Council, and we have several Council members here, to see how we can better implement what is needed. So thank you very much for being here. And of course, my colleague will uh, be in charge of the symposium. We have Mr. Le Foyer, Sylvain. Maybe some of you have not yet met him. He's sitting here. He's replacing Jim Marriott. And we have uh, Narges, Chief Fall, and the other colleague that they will introduce to you. They will be in charge of ensuring that uh, we do the best, and we will be available to continue to discuss with you. Whatever we can do, it's a priority not only for ICAO. It has been recalled by the UN Security Council. So it means all the member states in several fora have confirmed that it's important. In UNODC, in uh, OSCE, in EU, everywhere, it's important to, to do what we need to. It's not an easy task, but we count on you to be able to deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monsieur Gibault. We're running just a bit late on time. We'll try to make up as we go along, which provides me the opportunity to say that we are now ready for the coffee break. So I'd like to thank our sponsor, GET Group Holdings Limited, for their support of this networking opportunity. I'd also like to thank Entrust Data Card for having sponsored this morning's breakfast. So we'd like to see you back here at about 11.10 so that we'll have other opportunities for networking during the whole symposium. So again, around 11.10, if you could be back in your seats and we'll resume right away. Thank you very much. Enjoy the networking.